Please try to relax. <laughs> I'm Janet Weaver, curator of the Iowa Women's Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries. Also from the archives, I'd just like to introduce my colleagues. At the back, associate curator Anna Holland, women in politics archivist Kate Razum, and our terrific graduate assistants, Emma Barton Norris, Abby Steam, and Avery Porter. This year, marks the 31st anniversary of the Iowa Women's Archives, founded in 1992 through the generous gift and remarkable vision of our co-founders, Louise Noun and Mary Louise Smith. And since Cara Mason, our founding curator, is here, I just want to introduce her as well. Yay. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Iowa City Public Library, and I'd like to thank the staff and librarians here for the tremendous work they do behind the scenes, including their wonderful tech support um, that makes all of this possible. The Louise Noun, Mary Louise Smith, Iowa Women's Archives is home to many rich collections that shine a light on the complex, controversial, and contested history of women's health as it relates to reproductive rights and gender equity. For a glimpse into some of those collections, I hope you'll visit the traveling exhibit upstairs on display here in the ICPL. Um, the Feminist Women's Health Movement exhibit was created by Anna Holland and draws on a wide range of original documents and artifacts from the IWA. These collections are a permanent part of the holdings where every month is Women's History Month. We're located up on the third floor of the main library at the UI, and we hope you'll stop by and visit us. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Wendy Klein. The IWA is delighted to have the opportunity to bring her to the University of Iowa for this Women's History Month event. Dr. Klein is Demas G. Seeley Chair in the History of Medicine and founding director of the Medical Humanities Program in the Department of History at Purdue University. She's the author of several articles and three books that focus on controversies in the history of women's reproductive health. She's published several op-ed pieces in the Washington Post related to her research and is the recipient of numerous fellowships and is Distinguished Lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Her books include Building a Better Race, Gender, Sexuality, and Eugenics from the Turn of the Century to the Baby Boom, Bodies of Knowledge, Sexuality, Reproduction, and Women's Health in the Second Wave, and most recently, Coming Home, How Midwives Changed Birth. She's currently working on two books, one on the history of psychedelics in psychiatric practice, and the other, which we'll hear about today, on the history of the pelvic exam. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wendy Klein. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for that lovely introduction and for bringing me here. Um, Jan, I came here in July to do a little bit of research for this book, and uh, she uh, gracefully invited me to return, so I appreciate that. Um, and I have an earlier history. Um, I gave a talk here, I think it was 2011. Is that right, Al? Uh, my old friend from graduate school is here. He's a professor at Grinnell, and he invited me to Grinnell and on the way to speak in 2011. And on the way, I gave a talk in the, the, in the archives when I was working on that second book on bodies of knowledge. So it's great to be back. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump right in because I have a lot to say and want to keep you as entertained as possible. Um, so, um, and just as a background, what I'm going to do today is give you a, a kind of a very quick overview of some trends um, in the history of the pelvic exam. The title of the book is, is Exposed, a History of the Ex a Pelvic Exam, and you'll, you'll sort of see that in this talk. Um, so I'm going to start with a pelvic performance um, out of popular culture. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, but what did I do wrong? OK, here we go. I can do it. I think that will go away in a second, yeah.
So, you must be Peggy Olson. Joan Holloway sent you over. She's a great girl. How is Joan? She sends her regards. She's a lot of fun. Must be a scream to work with her. Yes, it's pretty terrific. Mm -hmm. Try to make yourself comfortable and relax. <clears throat> I see from your chart and your finger that you're not married. That's right. And yet you're interested in the contraceptive pills. Well, I've... There's no reason to be nervous. Joan sent you to me because I'm not here to judge you. There's nothing wrong with a woman being practical about the possibility of sexual activity. Spread your knees. That's good to hear. Although, as a doctor, one would like to think that putting a woman in this situation is not going to turn her into some kind of strumpet. Slide your fanny towards me. I'm not going to bite. I'll warn you now, I will take you off this medicine if you abuse it. It's for your own good, really. But the fact is, even in our modern times, easy women don't find husbands. I understand, Dr. Emerson. I really am a very responsible person. Oh, I'm sure you're not that kind of girl. Now, Joan, I'm just kidding along here. You can get dressed. I'm going to write you a prescription for Enavid. They're $11 a month, but don't think you have to go out and become the town pump just to get your money's worth. Excuse my French. What happens when the prostate enlarges and the urine channel oh, gets well, tight? Oh, timely. <laughs> OK. Um, how many of you who are live in the room are familiar with Mad Men? Or have seen that. OK. Good. OK, because we're all older. My students are another story. Uh, but just as a little bit of background and to unpack the scene really briefly, so this is Peggy Olson, played by Christina Moss, a young woman from Brooklyn who's starting a new job as advertising executive secretary at Sterling Cooper, at the, in the uh, firm of Sterling Cooper. It's her first day on the job. And this is the pilot episode of Mad Men in 2007. Uh, and the office manager, Joan Harris, played by C Christina Hendricks, makes an appointment for P Peggy at the OBGYN. Why? Because Peggy is a girl Friday who is expected to be sexually available to clients prepared for sex in this new climate of sexual liberation. Uh, filmed in 2007, uh, the scene takes place, is supposed to take place in 1960. So the scene opens with Peggy uh, waiting for the gynecologist to enter. And she's reading uh, this book, which I heard a chuckle about, right? Uh, entitled, It's Your Wedding Night, What Every Bride Should Know, How to Be a Good Wife. Uh, now, remember this. I'm going to get back to this later on in my talk. The viewer knows, of course, that th this is not why she is at the gynecologist today. Then in walks the gynecologist, who is male, of, of course, because 93% of all gynecologists were male up until 1970, when that starts to change. Um, and he's smoking, of course, because everybody was smoking everywhere. And he is uh, condescending and judgmental, of course, because it's 1960. Uh, I see from your chart and your finger that you're not married, and yet you're interested in contraceptive pills, he states. And he agrees to prescribe them. Uh, but threatens that he will take her off them if she abuses them. And stresses that she should not start acting like a strumpet just because she has access to birth control. As he inserts the speculum, Peggy turns away and focuses on the photograph. Did you all notice that? The focus is on her face. Her face turns. Why does she look over there? The relaxing, comfortable scene, um, right? Many of us have had that experience. Sometimes they tape a picture onto the ceiling so you can forget where you are for the moment. Um, they also do that to indicate the, the year, that, so the viewer knows it's 1960. The month is wrong. It's March 1960, but the pill was not actually available till June. Just fun fact. Um, uh, so she grimaces in dis discomfort. Then we, the focus becomes the speculum. We hear the loud clink as, it, as, it, as he drops it into the dish. 
Um, and, and the scene is, a, is only two minutes long, but it really brilliantly captures all of the contradictions of 1960s America. The emergence of the birth control pill, supposedly marking the beginning of the sexual liberation. Peggy, a character who could have come straight out of Helen Gurley Brown's Sex and the Single Girl, free to do whatever she wants, as long as it includes pleasing a man, and yet still chastised for doing it. Still treated like a child at the gynecologist's office and warned to behave herself. Now, Peggy, as we know, is there for one simple reason, to obtain birth control, a prescription to birth control pills. So she endures the speculum. There's no discussion of why she has to have an exam, uh, whether or not she's going to get results of a pap test. Uh, and this is clearly, purely a transactional event, if an unpleasant one. But it's also no longer the case. For roughly 30-odd years in the United States, beginning in 1960, a trip to the gynecologist was nearly synonymous with getting the pill, or at least the main reason many young women visited the gynecologist. So for example, by 1973, 10 million women in the United States were on the pill. And if my math is correct, that um, equates to 10 million visits to the gynecologist every year, right? But by the 1990s, it was becoming clearer that more and more sexually active women were putting off a trip to the gynecologist due to the shame and fear of getting a pelvic exam, leading to unintended pregnancies. It was also clear that pelvic exams and pap screenings were unnecessary requirements for obtaining oral contraceptives. So organizations across the globe changed their recommendations such as the World Health Organization, who in 1994 stated that a pelvic exam was no longer necessary for safe use of oral contraceptives. And quickly thereafter, the FDA, the USAID, the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists all followed suit. So if it's unnecessary and studies show that women are avoiding it, why make it a requirement? Furthermore, if that's the case, uh, why are pelvic exams even necessary at all? Should we just do away with them? That is currently under debate. So in 2014, the American College of Physicians recommended against performing screening pelvic examinations altogether uh, in asymptomatic, asymptomatic non-pregnant adult women, stressing direct harms based on multiple studies linking the exam to either pain and discomfort or fear, embarrassment, and anxiety. Uh, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists were a little more reluctant. In 2018, uh, they made the following statement, which is their most recent. They could still see the benefits, sc writing, screening pelvic examinations in the context of a well-woman visit may allow gynecologists to explain a patient's anatomy reassure her of her normalcy, and answer her specific questions, thus establishing open communications between the patient and her gynecologic care provider. So the organization recommended that OBGYNs and other providers should counsel patients about benefits, harms, and lack of data, and then patient and provider should decide together whether the pelvic should be performed. Now, not surprisingly, this uh, discrepancy has contributed to some confusion. So for example, in a 2017 study, half of all patients surveyed could not answer the question, do you know why this examination is being performed right after having a pelvic exam? One half. But largely absent in this debate is why there is so much fear or shame or stigma about um, the exam or what can be done about it. So what is it about the exam that makes it so terrifying? I think it is, in part, a larger social political problem about language and stigma surrounding the female body. So I'm going to give just two brief recent examples to illustrate why I think that's the case. And the first comes from 2012, uh, when the Michigan State Representative Lisa Brown was banned from speaking in the House because she used the term vagina in a debate over an anti-abortion bill, a term which her Republican colleague found offensive. So in response to the gag order, she and uh, her fellow Congresswomen uttered the word more than 100 times, 
on the state capitol steps in Lansing while performing the vagina monologues. <laughs> I question, she said, if you think there's something wrong with the word vagina, what word would you like me to use instead? Um, I'm not going to be all little women by using some cutesy name, she said. The second example comes from, June, uh, um, from January of 2020, uh, when the National Archives was essentially caught um, erasing images off of this photograph. This is from the March 2017, the uh, Women's March in 2017, the Pussy Hat March, right? So in 2020, in May of 2020, um, the archives uh, created a display to celebrate um, the centennial of women's suffrage. And at the very entry, when you walk in, this is a life-size photograph of the march. And someone noticed that particular words had been blurred or erased from the signs. Anything that was anti-Trump or the word vagina or pussy was erased from this. Um, I want to point out the irony of that, that the National Archives, it's meant to preserve, right, <laughs> records and not alter them. Uh, so, and I was um, invited to comment on this in the story, which was in the Washington Post. And that led to an, uh, a live interview on CNN the next morning. And as I was waiting for Frederica to um, start talking, um, I suddenly thought, wait a second, am I allowed to say the word vagina on live television? <laughs> Shit. Um, so I didn't. But I mean, the, the irony, the, right, that I hadn't even thought that through. What, what am I allowed to say? Are they going to take me off the air? Which, of course, I did not want to have happen. Uh, so two just little examples of this um, to suggest the way in which the shaming of women's reproductive anatomy um, which we see in these instances, takes a toll on all women who have picked up the cue that they too should remain silent about their bodies. In a 2014 survey, for example, a majority of women in the UK between the ages of 16 and 25 have a problem using the terms vagina or vulva. This discomfort also results in a ba basic lack of anatomical knowledge. Only half of women aged 25 to 36 surveyed could accurately identify parts of the vagina on a simple diagram. And nearly one third of younger women admitted they avoided going to the gynecologist altogether due to shame and embarrassment. And just as a follow up in 2022, um, in the UK, 16 million women were eligible for cervical smear tests, as they call them, but only 11.2 million took the test, the lowest in a decade. Okay, so it's continuing to be a problem and potentially getting worse. So where does this come from? Where, why this discomfort, anxiety, and fear? And in fact, just back to that, the reason I found the 2022 statistic is um, somebody pointed out an article that came out in January this year in The Guardian um, in which they include this, these numbers to, and they, the, the, um, the author of the article attributed it in part to the language used of the speculum. And I didn't know this before, but if you live in the UK, apparently, and you cannot tolerate a regular size speculum, you want to guess what they call the speculum you get? Nope, a virgin speculum. Okay, so talk about boundaries between sex and everything. Okay. But this stigma is nothing new. I want to argue today. The stigma is present from the start. So what I want to briefly do today is trace this issue across three periods of gynecology to argue that the meaning and the purpose of the pelvic exam is linked to three things. First, how gynecology defines itself as a field in a particular time. Second, attitudes about sexuality. And three, new technology emerging at that time. So I'm going to breeze through these. And historians sometimes are a little um, uncomfortable with that idea of breezing through. But think of these as really three snapshots across time, a, a brief, quick tour of about 170 years of pelvic exams. So we'll start at the origins in the 19th century. Um, and an era which was really, the emphasis was on surgical or pathological gynecology. So the origins of gynecology and the professionalization of medicine are closely linked to the development of the modern speculum in the mid-19th century. 
And this is really a revolutionary moment as women's bodies had remained a mystery for centuries. So I'm going to step back even further than the 19th century, very briefly, to, to mention this. Medieval Christian moral laws prohibited physicians from physically examining women as the female body was shrouded in secrecy and in shame. And while male sex organs were visible, the uterus remained a mystery. In the 16th century, Flemish anatomist Andreas Vesalius became the first to capture what a uterus actually looked like, publishing his drawings of dissected corpses. I realize that's not a uterus, but this is, <laughs> this is general. Um, this was no easy feat. Most cadavers available for dissection were executed criminals who were primarily men. Some of the women Vesalius dissected were sex workers, one of whom ended up on the title page of his 1543 volume, On the Fabric of the Human Body. The woman had claimed to be pregnant, possibly to avoid execution, but after midwives examined her and declared she was not, she was hanged. The woodcut that captured her dissection exposed not only her naked body, but her reproductive organs, as Vesalius himself is, a depicted, uh, is depicted drawing back the skin and pointing to her uterus amidst a crowd of gawking men. I, don't, I know this is a, a, a thing. How do I? Oh, there. Right? OK, there's Vesalius. There's the. It was the unique position of the United States, and in particular, the role of slavery that would enable the medical gaze to position itself even deeper into the recesses of the female body, and by the 19th century, into the bodies of living women, largely thanks to gynecologist James Marion Sims, inventor of the Sims speculum. Yet the enslaved women who did the most to further the science of gynecology had even less power than those of the Renaissance sex workers whose crimes transformed them into anatomical subjects. This transformative moment allegedly occurred when Southern physician James Marion Sims figured out on his own how to suddenly peer into a woman's vagina. Introducing the bent handle of the spoon, I saw everything as no man had ever seen before, he writes in his memoir. And this, in turn, gives him the idea of the speculum. Now, this isn't quite true, but the claim struck. He was stuck. He was given credit as the father of American gynecology and used his sim speculum to develop gynecological procedures on the bodies of enslaved women. He was specifically interested in repairing vesicovaginal fistula, an opening between the bladder and the wall of the vagina, usually caused by protracted labor in childbirth, although I should note it could also be caused by forceps. Okay. Uh, he would spend nearly four years and do countless surgeries on a handful of enslaved women before finally repairing a fistula. And he did so often in front of an audience. But this discovery went well beyond simply repairing a fistula. Here was a tool that, in the words of a colleague, quote, caused the name of Sims to flash over the medical world like a meteor in the night. The speculum threw an abundance of light into the vagina and the womb, enabling exposure to what had previously been hidden from view. The speculum has been to diseases of the womb what the telescope is to astronomy, he claimed. And Sims himself agreed, writing in his memoir, I felt sure that I was on the eve of one of the greatest discoveries of the day. And though he doesn't really deserve the credit, in some ways he was right. There had been previous speculums developed in, in France and the UK, but whatever, we, that gets erased from the storyline. Um, in some ways he was right. The modern speculum came hand in hand with the professionalization of medicine in the mid-19th century and the establishment of gynecology as a legitimate field. It also enabled medical men to distinguish themselves from midwives who did not use the tool at the time and to enter what had previously been a female space of healing. However, and this is very important, Sims made it perfectly clear that he was not in any way enthused at the thought of peering into women's vaginas, saying, if there was anything I hated, it was investigating the organs of the pelvis. Um, so 
he, look, so I want to explain why this is important. Sims, who was a fan of uh, P.T. Barnum of circus fame, uh, was himself really a master showman, and I'm fairly sure this was part of his act. Because many people were appalled at the idea that medicine would legitimize peering into vaginas, right? So he has to appear, this is not for any kind of um, sexual desire. The very thing that made the speculum revolutionary exposure was also what made, what made it controversial. In the context of Victorian morality, this was scandalous and would blur the boundary between medicine and porno pornography or sexual sexuality. Um, and I love this photo because it, it, where's the exposure, right? Every, everything's hidden, and where is he looking? Okay, now part of that argument in, in the speculum debate in the 19th century was about the value of touch. That you didn't need to be able to see, you had to have the right kind, your fingers would see for you. Uh, but regardless, this is obviously embedded in the larger story about morality in the 19th century, white middle class morality. Um, so a couple of examples of those who were opposed to the idea of the speculum in the mid-19th century. Dr. Robert Lee in London in May of 1850 raised concern at a meeting of the Royal Medicine and Chirurgical Society of London. The meeting was kind of an emergency meeting held to discuss what to do about, how, should they recommend the, the use of the speculum or not. And Lee argues that repeated penetration with the speculum would both wound and eventually blunt women's modesty and was therefore unjustifiable on the grounds of propriety and morality. In unmarried women in particular, he writes, the integrity of their structures should not be destroyed with the speculum, nor their modesty wounded by an examination of any kind. Second example comes from Robert Brudenell Carter, who published a volume on women in hysteria in 1853, in which he wrote of the harm created by the speculum. I have more than once, he writes, seen young unmarried women of the middle classes of society reduced by the constant use of the speculum to the mental and moral condition of prostitutes, asking every medical practitioner under whose care they fell to institute an examination of the sexual organs. Now, those of us who have endured the speculum uh, have to sort of laugh at that, right? Sure, right, it's, uh, it's addictive. Um, <laughs> please give me another one. Uh, now, this association with prostitutes that he makes in this, in this quote is not um, random. In fact, in Paris, where prostitution was legal but regulated by the authorities, female sex workers were required to register and be examined with a speculum. And then if found to suffer from venereal disease, they would be detained and treated in a prison hospital. And this would later be followed in the UK as well with the establishment of the Contagious Diseases Act. What I find really interesting about this story is that um, these examinations in Paris were publicly witnessed by medical students and visitors from foreign countries, including, of course, the US. Because if you know anything about the history of medical education in the United States in the mid-19th century, you know that you had to go to Europe to be taken seriously, because medical education in the US was pretty much a joke. Um, and so. You, the, all the, you know, everyone that wanted to become successful, including James Marion Sims, goes to London, Paris, um, Berlin, and, and there they witness the examination of prostitutes. So again, you're um, emphasizing the, the sexual content. The reason behind it is, of course, for a sexual reason. And also this kind of public display, the fact that it becomes performative in a way that we even saw back to Vesalius, okay? This, this notion of bodies on display, sex workers or enslaved women who are disempowered, dead, uh, et cetera, for the purpose, alleged purpose of knowledge. So for these reasons, those who favored the speculum had to tread carefully. How did one convince a respectable white middle-class woman that it was necessary to peer inside of her body? One way was to link it to pregnancy and childbirth. The speculum, like other gynecological instruments, such as forceps, was a way to differentiate medical men from midwives. And if you know the larger history of childbirth in the United States, this is a gradual process in which midwives are virtually eliminated um, by medical men who really pathologize or at least medicalize childbirth, okay? And they introduce these instruments. 
So it's a way of kind of asserting their authority um, and expertise. So here's an example um, from a manual of AFA King's Manual of Obstetrics, who notes in his 1895 textbook that a vaginal exam while rarely needed, was necessary to determine whether a woman was in labor. He offered guidance to the young practitioner who may experience some embarrassment with his first vaginal examination. It was not necessary, he assured the reader, to obtain verbal consent of the patient before instituting the examination. Proceed without hesitation as if consent had already been obtained. Do not worry about exp explaining your actions. The less said, the better, he emphasized. Proceed without hesitation, just as in feeling the pulse. Should the woman cry, demure, and declare she cannot submit to the examination, he continued, proceed just the same. Only physical resistance should induce the physician to give up the examination, but this will seldom occur. Consent was unnecessary. It was the physician's right and duty to penetrate a vagina just as it was to take a pulse. So I just want to take, a, it's kind of disturbing, you know, I've now seen this a lot. But to see that the first time, I want to just unpack it for a second and emphasize the extent that this is still an issue with us today. That we continue to deal with unconsented pelvic exams on patients under anesthesia in medical um, schools, right? This is currently debated uh, across the, the country. Um, and so to think about the origins of some of those messages coming back in 1895 is significant. So that's one way of convincing people that this was appropriate. Others simply would urge caution in how they went about it. Okay, So this is another example from a, a, a textbook by Charles Reed uh, in 1901. It is well to remember in pursuing the bimanual method, especially when it becomes necessary to make upward pressure upon the vulvar orifice in order to reach high up in the pelvic cavity, that sometimes sensitive or passionate women may be incited to sexual orgasm from irritation of the clitoris. Hence, contact with that organ should be avoided as far as possible. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to say anything more. So there's an acknowledgment from the start that the boundaries between medicine and sexuality were blurred and that consent was not necessary. Note that the concern appears to be primarily on that of the patient, not the gynecologist. Either she was a prostitute that needed to be regulated or a middle-class woman that could be sexually stimulated. Okay, we're going to fast forward. Okay. Prevented the rise of preventive gy gynecology, so I'm jumping into the mid-20th century. Um, in the 20th century, especially after the introduction of the pap smear, pelvic exams became the norm, and the concern switches from inappropriately stimulating a woman to addressing frigidity, heavily influenced by Freudian theories. In 1955, Dr. A. Claire Sidall greeted his colleagues at the fourth annual meeting of the American Academy of Obstetrics and Gynecology with what he believed to be good news for the field. There are unmistakable signs that a new frontier of preventive medicine is developing in the private practice of gynecology, he wrote. The keystone in this new arch is the annual health inventory, and the chief emphasis is on pelvic cancer detection in presumably well women. Sadal was one of the first doctors in the United States to use the pap smear test for the detection of cervical cancer in private practice. And within a decade of Sadal's pronouncement of this new frontier, approximately 48% of all American women had received at least one smear test. Although I want to stress that most of these were white women, only about one in five black women had had a pap smear by 1963. Perhaps more significantly, the development of the pap smear justified the need for Sidal's recommended annual health inventory or yearly checkup. Uh, I remember growing up, it was you turn 18, you get a pap test, recalls cervical cancer survivor and advocate for prevention, Tamika Felder. Not that I knew what it was for or anything like that, she clarified, just like the survey, right? You just something you go and do. You turn 18, you get your pap test at least for certain generations. But for many women, including Felder, 
It was part of the coming of age ritual. And it was gynecologists like A. Claire Sedal who ensured that well women's healthcare would take place under the direction of the predominantly male gynecologist. So Sedal's proclamation came as gynecology was in the midst of transition. For too long, Sedal believed, the field of gynecology in both teaching and practice had emphasized curative medicine. In other words, gynecologists only treated those who were sick or pregnant. The problem with this approach was that, quote, the patient assumes the responsibility for when she needs the gynecologist. What's the problem with that? It leaves too much power in the hands of the patient who could then decide for herself when to seek treatment. And according to one gynecologist, many women did not like to be seen going to a gynecologist's office, quote, because it means either you are going to have a baby or you have female trouble. So the stigma of consulting a gynecologist, therefore, further constrained a gynecologist's access, access to a re readily available patient base. Indeed, prior to the 1940s, only a tiny fraction of women had regular checkups with a gynecologist. Now here's where it gets interesting. An influential branch of mid-century, mid-20th century gynecology adopt what they called psychosomatic gynecology relying heavily on Freudian theory in their approach to gynecology. So this is um, directly a quote from a textbook on a chapter on the psychosomatics, in which they say, in gynecology more than any other specialty, the combination of disease with sexual problems requires an understanding of the psychology which was developed by Freud and his students. Um, so what does psychosomatic mean? It's all in your head, OK? that will become important. Another example from a textbook, it is known that a great number of patients who come to the office with gynecologic complaints actually have no demonstrable organic disease. Quite often, it is a way of indicating anxiety, fear, resentment, or guilt in the use of this, female, this part of the body. Why? Because of all the connotations which are associated with the genitals. OK, why did I highlight anxiety, fear, resentment, or guilt? Anybody know? Does it, did it come up earlier in the talk? Right? The, the, ACO, the American College of Physicians, one of the reasons they're arguing to um, terminate regular pelvic exams was for these reasons. Okay? Here we see it buried in the text in 1950 um, as an issue. So where's the anxiety, fear, resentment, or guilt coming from? In the 1950s, they had a very specific answer. Uh, the 19th century concern, as if you re re recall, was that the problem was the penetration of the speculum, which would either wound their modesty or sexually stimulate them. But now the speculum isn't the problem at all. Anybody wants to want to guess what's, what the problem is? It's the mothers. Many mothers tell their daughters that sexual relationships are degrading, improper, shameful, or dangerous. The mother or aunt or friend trains the young girl to feel it is sinful to have sexual desires, and such teaching leaves a stigma with the girl which may greatly influence her sexual behavior. It is not unexpected if such a girl develops and retains a feeling of repulsion or disgust toward sexual activity. Um, so who's going to step in and solve this problem? It's up to the gynecologist to rectify the situation, right? Of course. Um, it is very important that the wife shall be completely satisfied sexually. If and when she is, she becomes relaxed and productive in other activities. We see all kinds of neuroses due to nervous irritability caused by sexual frustration, right? So suddenly this becomes um, under the rubric, under the responsibility of a gynecologist to solve this problem. Um, Premarital pelvic exams therefore become common in the 1950s and 60s in order to ensure that young brides were ready for the wedding night. Okay, I promised I'd come back to this. Here we go. Right, this is the era in which um, you, if you showed up, you would be given a, a pamphlet like that uh, for that very reason, uh, as a way to prepare yourself for that um, special night. So one more rather um, lengthy example um, before we move on to illustrate this, again from 
uh, practical gynecology in 1950. We had a patient recently who was examined soon after marriage and presented a very thin hymenal ring, but pronounced vaginal spasm. In other words, the hymen, the ring, the, the ring was thin. There shouldn't be uh, spasm, right? It's not. It shouldn't be a problem. When she was relaxed by discussion of her problem in a sympathetic manner, the vaginal spasm disappeared and a medium speculum was inserted. This was in the office, and during the discussion, she admitted that she had been taught by her mother for many years that intercourse was, was base and indecent. It was obvious that she had come to fear the sexual function very much. Marriage in itself could hardly change this deeply seated pattern overnight. Although the marriage contract gave her and her husband permission to proceed, she was psychologically unable to permit the man to enter. Okay? Uh, but the gynecologist could help out, right? He, he's there to, to fix that problem. Guiding young women through the mechanics of sex to ensure marital stability, gynecologists established their position as moral arbiters during the post-war era. And by doing so, of course, they underscored the link between pelvic examination and sexual practice. So even though the technology that enabled this to happen was the pap smear, used for cancer detection, not for sexual activity. Remember, this is before the link between HPV and um, sexually transmitted disease was known. So um, no association in terms of cervical cancer de detection and sexual activity. But it's the smear, it's the pap smear that justifies the routine annual well woman exam that establishes the doctor-patient relationship on Freudian terms which by 1960 will be required for the prescription of hormonal birth control. I'm going to say it one more time because that was complicated, but I want you to see the, the link, which from the outset doesn't seem that obvious, right? Well, why would the pap smear, which doesn't have to do with sex, result in the doctor becoming a marriage counselor? So again, it's the smear that justifies the routine annual exam that establishes that doctor-patient relationship on these Freudian terms which will then be required for prescription to the birth control pill, okay? At least until the 1990s, as I stated in the beginning. Okay, final example, 1970s, I'm calling it gynecology under siege. By the 1970s, health feminists turned this theory on its head. And not just health feminists, feminists in general turned Freud um, a lot of this on its head. But here, the pain and shame and anxiety experienced in the doctor's office was not in their heads, nor a result of bad mothering or sexual repression, but by poor sexist treatment. Okay, so the problem is not the mothers, it's the gynecologists. Um, inherently captured in, in, the, the, in the performance itself. So you see examples like this. Ellen Frankfurt's best-selling vaginal politics, um, who controls a woman's body, doctors, lovers, drugs, women, um, in her opening, um, in her introduction, she's describing her pelvic exam, and she highlights this fact. I was naked. He was dressed. He was standing up. I was quiet. He was giving the orders. So that for many health feminists, um, feminists in general who in this time period are, are kind of labeling misogyny and sexism as at the root of all problems in terms of um, feminist liberation um, you know, and repression, they see that gynecologist is kind of the, the, the perfect symbol of that because it's, the gynecologist is almost always male and, and all of these other barriers, the, the, he's the dressed, um, he's infantilized. I mean, just think about that scene in Mad Men, right? The power dynamic. Um, so they turn to this as sort of an example, a prime example of the problems of, of late 1960s America, okay? Um, and the fact that all most OBGYNs were, were male. So one solution was to bring more women into medicine, as quotas are finally starting to be eliminated by 1970. Increasing numbers of female students, however, did not immediately transform medical education or training, um, which was su surprising for some. Many suffered, many of these new um, fe female medical students suffered harassment and ridicule, ridicule in medical school, a problem publicized by Harvard Medical School's first female dean who, wrote, who published under a pseudonym, I should add, Why Would a Girl Go Into Medicine? 
a scathing attack on the treatment of women at U.S. medical schools in 1973, in which she surveyed 146 women attending 41 different medical schools in the United States and um, describes the men's club atmosphere apparent in the laugh-getting comments and pictures about female sexuality that female students described being subjected to. One woman complained of hearing men made re making remarks to the effect that the gynecological exam must be titillating to perform. Now, these attitudes were also captured in the popular press. Playboy magazine frequently highlighted female nurses, for example, as Playboy centerfolds, along with cartoons that sexualized the doctor-patient relationship. So I have three of these images to show you. Um, and this one he's saying, now to test your reflexes. Gosh, I hardly know where to begin. And they're not exactly consulting physicians, Miss Walters. As a matter of fact, they're just some fellows I play golf with. Now, in Playboy, juxtaposed with these cartoons were news stories suggesting that perhaps male doctors really engaged in these scenarios. Um, for example, they highlighted a piece from the American Journal of Psychiatry, which found that about 5% of physicians have had, had had sexual intercourse with some of their patients, and a further 8% said that they occasionally used erotic practices as treatment. Now, is this a problem in Playboy? Perhaps not. Right, but there it is. So health feminists in the 1970s drew increased attention to these problems as pornographic, misogynistic, um, and, to, and demanded reform in medical education and gynecological practice to protect and respect female patients. Others separated entirely from professional organizations to create women-centered, women-controlled feminist health centers, including here, right, in Iowa City with the Emma Goldman uh, Goldman Clinic, um, emphasizing self-help, that all knowledge production should begin with women's experiences. And in, in 1976, there were about 50 of, of these uh, women's health centers, uh, many of whom all the people involved, first of all, were female, and second, often didn't have medical training themselves. They were all lay, they called themselves you know, lay um, leaders. Um, with the idea they could teach each other, teach themselves and each other about this. Uh, so what's happening here in terms of, of technology is really turning the technology of the speculum on its head. And this is my favorite cartoon. Um, you know, that this becomes a symbol of female power rather than subjugation. But if you can't see who she's stepping on, um, she's got the AMA on, her, on your left. And then underneath um, are uh, the uh, Planned Parenthood and Freud, OK? So a direct attack on that psychosomatic gynecology from the 1950s. So, um, so in this third phase, the gynecology under siege, the technology is self-help. And the pelvic exam has now been charged as something that has been eroticized, something for male pleasure rather than a useful screening procedure. So in, in this particular lens, the only useful exam is self-given, get rid of the gynecologist altogether, right? Um, teach yourselves how to do it. You don't need an external person uh, doing, helping you do this exam. So where are we now? Um, just taking us through from, from one extreme, I like the, from the 1880s to 1963, from you know, fully clothed to absolute complete exposure. And then um, 2018, does anybody know who that is in this picture? Larry That's Larry Nassar, mm -hmm. right. Um, things have not necessarily gotten better, OK? Um, so I'd say we're in a state of confusion. On the one hand, there's recognition, among other things, that Sims isn't necessarily a hero, right? We've all um, been exposed uh, to that idea. Um, this is his statue being removed um, in April 2018 from Central Park. Um, on the other, the continued stigma of the terms vagina uh, and vulva, the anger felt by many in a post-row world about who controls women's bodies, and a series of sex abuse scandals that only heightens anxieties about whether or not one should seek the guidance of a gynecologist. 
Oh, and, and, and also, of course, this issue of um, consent. So this is, uh, sorry, this has been blocked out. Anything that's in color um, is a state in which they have introduced bans against unconsented, I should say, um, uh, pelvic exams on anesthetized patients. Okay, it's just a matter of which year the decision was made. Um, so there's an, a recognition and a, a movement to try to do something about this. Okay, but finally, I want to end on a light note, not, um, to just look at what's happened since 2014. Um, so between 2014 and 2022, hospitals and universities have paid staggering sums to settle up sex abuse cases involving physicians, many of whom have abused students, athletes, and patients for decades. In 2014, Johns Hopkins gynecologist Nikita Levy was charged with conducting unnecessary and unwanted medical tests in order to expose patients' genitalia, conducting pelvic exams without the presence of a chaperone, and inserting his ungloved pa finger into patients' vaginas. Um, over a period of 25 years in practice, over 12,000 patients. And he was caught um, when one of his assistants, oh, hold, definitely hold his ears. <laughs> He's too young for it. <laughs> um, one of his assistants, a nurse in the room, started realizing that he always had this pen on a lanyard, and he would tend to, when he leaned over, he would angle the pen. Um, and so she, she basically stole it one day and took it home and realized it was a camera um, that he was using to literally, you know, peer into vaginas. Um, so we have the Levy case in 2014. Michigan State University reached a $500 million lip settlement in 2018 for victims of Larry Nassar, team doctor for USA Gymnast Gymnastics. Two years later, Ohio State agreed to pay over $46 million to 162 athletes abused by Richard Strauss, a team doctor at the university from 1978 to 1998, um, who committed suicide in 2005. In 2021, University of Southern California set the record with a whopping $1.1 billion settlement for victims of George Tyndall, the only full-time gynecologist at USC's student health clinic for nearly 30 years. Over 300 women had accused Tyndall of mistreatment and sexual abuse dating back to the early 1990s, but no one listened to them. In 2022, the University of Michigan announced a settlement of $490 million to over 1,000 victims of Dr. Robert E. Anderson. Like Tyndall, Anderson worked for nearly 30 years in a university position, serving for a time as the director of university health services and as an athletic doctor. Former students stated that they were abused during physical examinations, required to participate in athletic programs at the university. Investigators concluded that Anderson performed examinations that were unnecessary and improper. He insisted, for instance, on a pelvic exam for a woman who had complained of a sore throat. So clearly how a pelvic exam is performed, interpreted, and experienced has a lot to do with context how the field of gynecology represents itself, how female sexuality is understood in relationship to medicine, and what sorts of technology are used to promote female reproductive health. What it means to us today is still not entirely clear. So I end with a question. What is the ultimate outcome for our bodies and our health if we dismiss the pelvic because of its sordid history and its association with fear, anxiety, embarrassment, or pain and discomfort. Is there a way to embrace the pelvic as a potential lifesaver, as a way of, to educate and empower, or is it destined for extinction? I'm not a gynecologist. I don't have the ultimate answer. But either way, in a post-row world, it's even more important to stop avoiding this conversation and to end the silence. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Wendy, for that fabulous, fascinating talk and uh, very disturbing in so many ways, but brings up <laughs> such important issues for us to talk about today. We have time for questions. If you have a question in the live audience here, um, Kate has a microf microphone, so just raise your hand and she'll come. If you're online, put your question in the chat and we'll make sure to get to it. So. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact that like the racialization of the speculum has on uh, the contemporary hesitation to visit the gynecologist. Or contemporary what, sorry. Contemporary. Uh, hesitation to visit the, the impact on con the contemporary hesitation. I mean, it seems like Sims invents the speculum. The model we use today is different, but not real. Like the speculum wasn't designed to be comfortable, right? Because Sims was operating on enslaved women. There were all of these beliefs about like black women not feeling pain, pain right. right? All of these things. So it just feels like if we are going to embrace the pelvic exam, it needs to be like completely revamped with like new tools, right? I mean, like, is there like a future wherein we redesign the speculum to move it away from Sims model? What do you think? Yeah, well, a great question. Um, let me start by going back to my opening slide because this is actually from an art exhibit. Okay. Um, so now Bustamante, who's an artist at USC, um, put together an exhibit in San Antonio called Bloom, which is, juxtaposes the sordid history of it. Um, I was just describing this. I'll go, if, in, allow me to just walk you through the exhibit briefly. Briefly, You walk in and there's a red velvet curtain um, and you have to kind of enter through the drapes and then there's flesh colored walls. And directly at the other end is a um, gynecological table that's hanging from chains. Um, and there's light coming. It's exposed through a skylight over it. And the, that particular um, section of the exhibit is called Lucy Betsy Anarcha in honor of the, th the three that we know. Um, and that's all really we know about them, right? Um, to, to kind of force yourself to encounter that. Um, and because I, I went and visited it and I talked to the curator and they were able to give me um, the reactions that viewers had to this. And so many people were stunned. Um, like, how could I not know this, right? How could I not understand that the history of gynecology was born on the, on the, on the backs of the vaginas <laughs> of enslaved women? And the other part of our exhibit is to try to say, can we come up with something more comfortable? So the exhibit's called Bloom because she has these images, um, you can't see them here, but of, of flowers, of petals, of something soft and gentle as a way of, you know, why can't we reimagine it? So the general answer is, um, and, and, that, and she's actually talking to um, uh, marketing to try to literally come up. And now I've learned other companies are also exploring this. Um, so there is a movement, but I want to get back to your point about race because it's, it's not just about comfort, right? It's about distrust and pain and, and, and a lack of recognition, um, which still there are studies, as, or I think as recent as 2018, in which um, there's still assumptions among many in the medical field that pe people of color don't feel pain the same way, right? So that hasn't gone away. Um, and the other thing is I would say it's not just Sims, but the whole history of medicine in America, um, if you think of Tuskegee, syphilis treatments, there's a reason why um, people of color are, are not less necessarily going to be trusting um, that they should submit to whatever they're told to submit to with, with good reason. So, I, I mean, it's a larger problem. I, um, I think acknowledging it and having those conversations is the first step. Um, having more people of color in medicine Right, so that um, you know, ideally that, that that would help as well. But conversations, and and recognizing that this has been present from the start. So thank you. Which museum in San Antonio? Well, it's it was a it's gone now. Um, it was Art Pace is called. Okay. Now she's doing it in um, upstate New York, 
Um, so it's been traveling around. I can I can send you, I can give you a link to her information if, if you're interested. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm just. Do I need to? No, nope, I think. Okay. It's um, I'm thinking about the, where you ended and uh, and thinking about how the an, the idea that people women had to have an annual pelvic exam, which was really prevalent as I was growing into adulthood, um, was important in some very way, in some ways, because many of us, that was the only uh, medical exam we had all year. And for many of us, our OBGYN was our only doctor yep. for decades. And so there was that important positive role of the, um, the annual pelvic. And I'm wondering where this debate stands now. Well, I think, thank you. Um, really great question. And I think if we go back to what ACOG is saying, um, I, I think they're recognizing that um, in, the, in the language here, um, can I, I'm so incompetent with these things. Whatever, the language down there, right? That um, to explain a patient's anatomy, reassure her of her normalcy. Um, answer her specific questions, establishing open communication. I mean, I think that's embedded in that. The concern, the benefits of having it are exactly that. Um, that the answer, well, let's just do away with it because it's, it's unnecessary. Um, so I don't think it's a good idea. And there's certainly still, study, I mean, people are still dying of cervical cancer, right? <laughs> and, and, and those OBGYNs often us about other things, not just our, you know, reproductive health. Right. So, so then if it's, is there a way to have an annual exam? Um, is there an incentive to bring people in for an annual exam if they're not required to do so? Right? Like, how do you get the, how do you entice someone if they're no longer required? Which is why I think it's so interesting. I mean, you have 10 million people on the pill. They're going to the gynecologist because that's the only way they're going to get the pill. So what happens when that's gone? You know, what, what do you lose in the process? What's gained and what's lost? I mean, it seems to me, I was surprised when I did this research. I had no idea when I started this book that the regulations had changed. Because you know, I'm old enough, I just, you know, I just thought it's still, it's still what, if you're on the pill, you have to go. Um, and, and so I do see there's, there's a loss in that process. I see the gain if there's unintended, if people are avoiding going in the unintended pregnancies, but then shouldn't we just get over the stigma and the shame, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a better way of dealing with it? What difference, um, I don't know if you know the answer, but having more women practicing as gynecologists, what difference has that made? or can that make? And um, secondly, have you ever given your talk before an audience um, from, of a gynecologist? Yeah. And, and if you did, how did they respond? Thank you. So the first question, oh gosh, well, oh women, right. So currently, um, her, the last statistic I could get my hands on was 58% is, is, the, is really the feminization of gynecology. So now we're up to 58% OBGYNs, but 85% residents, right? Which means that the, it's trending, that we are heading toward 85% or more. Um, so I have two thoughts about that. One is the, the minute something becomes feminized, it becomes less important, sadly, right? Um, and so learning about this very small percentage of funding that goes to research for anything about female reproductive health, right? Um, that's not going away. That's, you know, because it's, you know, it's not taken seriously as much as it becomes feminized, sadly. Um, the other thing is this assumption, and I've had a lot of conversations with, with female gynecologists about this. Many people, they're still entering the same type of medical education, right? They have to go through the same hurdles, the same hoops to get to where they land. So in the process, they potentially lose whatever, 
you know, empathy or whatever we would assume they would bring to the table because of the process, which in and of itself, now I haven't been to medical school, I'm just basing this on conversations. Um, and I had, um, the last time I, I spoke about this, um, I had a female doctor at Northwestern University Hospital stand up and say, I'm one of those people that you point, I was a 1970s feminist, and then I went to medical school and I forgot all about it. Or I, I maybe not forgot, but I lost it, right, in the process of becoming a medical doctor, becoming an OBGYN. Um, that's not inevitable, but, you know, our assumptions that are, that are sort of essentialist, that all women are just going to feel this way because, particularly now, and it's not all women have vaginas, right? We ha people with vaginas, right, um, is, you know, we can't, we can't hold on to that either. So... But it still, it changes the structure. It gets us out of the 1960s kind of um, mocking women in medicine. But we have a long way to go. And in terms of speaking to doctors, yeah, I mean, I'm very careful to say, particularly on this last slide, um, I'm, I'm careful to say, oops, whatever, the one with all the 2014 to 2022. It's not to say all gynecologists are pervert, perverts at all, right? Um, it's not to make them feel like I, I'm a, accusing them all of, of, of being ineffective medical practitioners. It's drawing attention to the fact that we don't have boundaries and regulations in place. We're not having the conversations that enable the 99% who are doing a good job to, to get the credit of doing a, a good job um, and to recognize that history matters that that and I think one of the reasons they are receptive after I you know hem and haw and I'm worried about the reaction uh, and then they thank me is because I'm not doing this the evidence is showing them I'm not claiming these I'm showing them the textbook from 1901 that says this information in there it's part of their history and so you know th that's why we need to keep studying history that's why medical Education should include history as, as part of it. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so I have, I had a cousin, she was in her 40s, and she, I, I don't really know if like her place of living had anything to do with it, but she was um, kind of in a rural area, but she passed away from cervical cancer in her early 40s. And I've always like thought about this because my mom always told me like, well, she never went to the doctor. She never went, she never really took care of herself. Like she said that she felt like she didn't pay attention to her body or how, like pain she was feeling. So I'm kind of I always think about like maybe and you kind of noted it too, like is there a connection between like lack of education and like lack of knowledge and like the misogyny and, and sexism and within like the medical industry and like why she didn't go to the doctor? Was she ashamed? Obviously, like did she not think her health or her pain was like Nessus was like important. Um, I don't know if that's a question, but I was just yeah. trying to think of all these connections, like what led her to finally getting, um, you know, like getting diagnosed with stage four cervical cancer yeah. and the fact that it went so far and like why she didn't go to the gynecologist or get her yearly checkups and, and then like, so then she passed away so soon. So right. I was just kind of wondering like how you thought about that in terms of, you know, like from their demographics or whatever, their education and like, yeah, yeah so, so I don't I, know if that's a question. Thank but. you. <laughs> I want to talk about her, Tamika Felder, uh, who I feature in my book, who created this organization called Survivor, who, if she had met, this is your cousin, did you say? Um, she, she would have embraced your, her, her organization is all about educating and awareness about this. So Tamika was a very um, well-established newscaster in Washington, D.C. And uh, when she moved from Charleston to Washington, D.C., she um, was giving up a job with health insurance, and her mother said, make sure you go get your physical before you, know, you, you do this. So she did. Um, and she sees this doctor who's female, who's white, who looks at her and says, you know, if you were pregnant, you wouldn't even know it. You're so fat. And Tamika said, get your hands off my body. And she walked out of the office. And three years later, she found out she had cervical cancer. 
okay? I mean, this relates to your comment, too. Um, I mean, I blame that doctor uh, because she stopped going for those reasons. And, and I bring it up because I'm not, necessar- I'm not sure it's necessarily about education. I think it's one negative experience. And raise your hand if you've ever had a negative um, experience with a gynecologist. That's all it takes. It's not fun to go. Maybe you don't have health insurance. Maybe you're busy. You put it off. Or you get treated poorly because of the shape of your body. And then, you know, you develop cancer. So um, I think the, the broader conversation is really about how do we make this something that people take seriously, um, that shows we value our bodies, and that doctors should treat them with respect, regardless of what they look like, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is a tragedy, and that's why she started that organization. And it's, it's, if you Google her, she's an amazing person doing exactly that, creating support groups, getting people talking about it, trying to educate, right? So I guess it's a how you define education, but lay education. Get the word out um, that even if these organizations are not promoting annual um, exams, ask for them if you're at all concerned so as to prevent these stories. Because her, the organization is filled with tragedies just like your cousin's for, for those reasons. So thank you. Um, at the end of your talk, you mentioned like um, post row. So I was just wondering how you think like the practice of gynecology will change now that some states are like yeah. outline like abortions, the access to like sexual health and like even in Florida, like, um, we talked about it in one of my classes, but, like, kids aren't allowed to, like, learn about their period until, like, sixth grade. So, like, I'm just wondering how you think, like, gynecology and everything will be affected by that. Yeah, that is such an important question. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Um, actually, when I was giving a similar talk to this at Northwestern University at 8 in the morning for Grand Rounds, at 7 in the morning, before me, I don't know how they do this, was a conversation with the Guttmacher Institute about the impact of what's happening to residency programs in states that have now um, um, made abortion illegal because nobody wants to go there. (laughs) So then, you know, fast forward however long, hopefully it's not too long before we get this mess taken care of, but um, in the meantime, you're going to have these deserts, right? The people that need um, help the most are not going to have it because nobody wants to go there because they don't want to get sued. Um, so I think there's an absolute direct um, connection uh, between that. Regardless of your politics, if, if something goes wrong down there and you're in a state in which there's nobody trained to deal with it, even if it has nothing to do with pregnancy, they're not learning about female bodies because they don't want to be in a state in which they could go to jail. For, for even just studying there. They don't want to put themselves in that position. So I think it's a huge issue. It's probably one of the most important. So thank you. <laughs> I'm not scary. I just wanted to bring up, somebody mentioned about comfort. And during like the Emma Goldman when they started, uh, part of their uh, direction was to create a more comfortable situation where the stirrups would have footies on them. And um, instead of the metal cold speculums, they used to have plastic ones. And then they had to stop using those, I think. But due to, oh, do you? Okay, great. So um, there is the the women's movement in the 70s did you know, aim towards more yeah. comfort in the in the in the room. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to bring up because you mentioned it was fifty percent could identify their anatomy, women. In this one UK survey. Okay, so I think that's pretty significant as a lack of education about our own anatomies. And the, another thing Emma Goldman did is they always offered a mirror 
so that when you go in there, you can learn about your anatomy. You know, it's not always going to look like it does in the, in the books, in the anatomy books. <laughs> and so, and so I, you know, I always ask for a mirror, and the gynecologists are like, nobody asks for a mirror anymore. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, I started at Emma Goldman. I just thought this was a normal behavior. <laughs> um, so it, but it made me kind of sad that women don't ask for a mirror, or they're not offered a mirror. Um, so, the, you know, the, those are kind of things that went through my head as you were giving your talk. And the other thing that really bothered me is, um, like, the, uh, there was um, a graduate student, a couple graduate students that did... Uh, a film about the Emma Goldman Clinic and how it got started. And I talked about, you know, how the anatomy is and, you know, why they had no picture of the anatomy in the film. And, and one of the filmmakers said, we're not going to show her vagina. And I just thought, that to me is the whole reason yeah. <laughs> for having the Emma Goldman Clinic is to demystify the woman's body instead of making it this thing where you, you know, don't look at it. Um, and that really the only place you see that is in pornography. Right. And I think, I mean, that's just a problem we have in our society. And the, and the other thing, as you mentioned, the, the two, 2014 through 2022, I also thought of um, Bill Cosby. Oh, yeah. Because he apparently got a gynecologist to give him that date rape drug oh, or whatever drug that. that was that made people unable <coughs> to react when he abused them. So anyway, that's it. So you, when were you at the Emma Goldman? Well, I, let's see, in the 80s, early 80s. But I can remember as, I don't know, you know, we all have our stories about <laughs> learning about, you know, going to the gynecologist, but my friends in junior high would say, oh yeah, you have to go there and there's this hammer they put inside you, and I was like, I am not interested in going and having this hammer, you know, inserted in me. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because you don't really read about that very much. I mean, I'm sure there are books out there, but when I was young, there really weren't a whole lot of books to describe, get you prepared for, for that exam. You just kind of heard through, right. you know, your friends. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. And Lama, if I can just respond, I know it wasn't a question, but a couple of things. First, um, for, for the younger people in the room, part of what the, the mirror did that was so incredible was, you know, this is before the internet. What? This is, I know, hard to imagine. You didn't have access to images. This is right, I mean, the, finally, Our Bodies, Ourselves, the book had come out in 1971, um, so if you could get your hands on that, right, this is the first sort of lay uh, women's book about their health for themselves, our bodies, ourselves, where you could see pictures, but otherwise you wouldn't know any of that. So, so many women I've interviewed or, and have written about this and talk about it, that ability to see what it, that looks like, you know, after everything, I, you know, it's been hidden, was incredibly revolutionary. For many people, that was the... I've, one of the ch chapters of my Bodies of Knowledge book is called Learning from the Uterus Out because sh this one woman who's, who I quote sa saying that just felt like that was, it was so um, at her core and it, was, it had been hidden all her life. So that kind of revolutionary sense that I don't, I don't think today's, you know, Gen Z, you know, certainly couldn't absorb that because we're in such a different world. The other thing I just want to say is in the herb, so prior to when you were at Emma Goldman, there's great stuff in the, in the collection um, in the 70s when they had one doctor who was male working there and, and all of the, the rest of them were female and they didn't like his bedside manner. And there's, I don't know if you, there's this there, the tense exchange where they're lecturing him on what he can and can't do. And guess what he does? He quits. But it's, it's funny to see because they were just like, this is inappropriate. You can't act like that. You know? And then he's like, who are you to tell me? You know, I have the MD. And they're like, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I mean, there's, there's layers of really juicy stuff in there about how they're trying to work this out um, you know, on their feet, trying to figure out how to make things the experience different.
All right, now I'm ready for you. Sorry, the the very masculine yeah, Harley yeah. Davidson. It seems like a lot of the problems that we had and a lot of things we started off already figuring out people when they're they're criminals. That means to be justified when we can use their bodies for science or not. Did they consent to that? We didn't care because they already eliminated a whole bunch of stuff. So I guess like when you talk about bedside manner and a whole bunch of things, it seems a lot of education and consent hand in hand, especially in the medical field, but it seems like no other area of medicine requires this much thought, which is kind of sad because it should just be standard, but it, it truly is a more private area anyway. But like, how much of the practice of consent revolves around the evolution of medicine itself? That's a very smart <laughs> question. Um, I mean, things really start to change in the 1970s. A lot of people think it's the Nazis and Nuremberg and everything, but that doesn't really change things here because Americans thought, well, we're not Nazis, we're not so we don't, we don't need to worry about it. And it's really um, sort of 1966 forward, there's this expose that, by, um, uh, I forget his first, Henry Beecher, I think, where he, he lists the number of um, current medical studies going on in which consent was not being used and people are publishing about this. Not many people know that the, the Tuskegee study, um, they were publishing this stuff. It wasn't like somebody had to walk into a room and discover something that was hidden. It was published. People just didn't, it wasn't in that mindset until really in the 1970s, and that's when you have the development of me medical ethics, um, IRBs, institutional review boards, and this sense that, you know, People, patients have a right. Some of that comes directly out of the women's health movement. You know, this is the first large body of people who are saying, you know, don't fuck with our bodies. Excuse my language. Um, and so, you know, they contribute to this, this recognition that consent really matters. And I think when I found that textbook quote of, of the doctor, Dr. King, who says, just act like you did get consent, I found that so powerful because it was so blatant. It was such a blatant reminder that consent did, really didn't matter among people who were devalued. Mm -hmm. for what, what, and so it's also about power, of course, right? The people without power, do we need their consent? Like, what are they going to do if we don't? And we're, you know, we're probably helping them along the way. And so, you know, it's okay. Right, and they're not going to tell anybody, and we need it. So part of the issue, right, is, is between clinical research practice, um, what you're doing for research purposes, and what you're doing to help a patient. Um, and, you know, some doctors would try to combine the two and say, well, yeah, it's for research, but I am really helping the patient. But to your question, one last thing um, about consent and feelings. So if you're a medical doctor, no, a medical student, and you're trying to learn how to do a pelvic exam that's comfortable, and you're learning on a patient that's fully anesthetized, what are you learning? You're not learning, you're not going to get a response. If you're doing it on um, a, a pelvic model, like a, um, a not a human. <laughs> um, yeah, a mannequin, thank you. Uh, same thing. So, so the question is, for some in medical school, having not gone, but if you're trying to diagnose properly, so they could say, well, yeah, but I'm trying to see if there's a tumor there or something. I'm less concerned with how this feels. I'm trying to get my job done. I'm trying to make sure that I'm not missing something. I don't, you know, if they're uncomfortable, that's not my problem. So I think part of it is also a misunderstanding or um, miscommunication between what the purpose of what this doctor is doing, right? Because they might disagree that the most important thing is comfort. Mm. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so, I. Oh, should I wait for? Oh, sorry. I just saw a hand no up, and, and. Thanks. I have a couple statements and then a question. Um, I'm actually a third-year medical student. Oh, okay. Um, Did so I offend you? 
No, no, I actually completely agree with what you said because we do uh, fake models which don't even have legs or a torso. Then we do anesthetized patients with consent only. It's, okay. They're very serious about that here. Um, so that's at least something that's cool about the program here. And then you do it on like a, I don't, I don't want to say lie, unanesthetized person. It's a whole different ball game. It's like, it's, it's like you feel completely unprepared. It's like not, not even the same thing. Um, two, we just had our match. Um, not me, but the grade above me did. And every single person at OBGYN changed their match list because of the row reversal. Wow. Um, which, for those of you who don't know, residency, like, match is, like, where you want to get a job or, like, where you, like, send in your applications. And so, like, Idaho was out. And uh, a lot of people took it away from Iowa, which I believe has the 50th most OBGYNs per capita in America, which is last for <laughs> those of you playing at home. Um, and then I guess my last question, uh, it's kind of a little more lighthearted, but... Um, still important. Uh, so a lot of things in medicine are eponymous, right? So you have things like Addison's disease or they're like named after people, right? And so a lot of, there's a lot of power in a name. And recently there's been a kind of movement to take away bad names. So like Schurg Strauss syndrome, some vasculitis was named after a Nazi. So now it's granulomatous polyangitis vasculitis, right? So it's <laughs> something like that. Um, and kind of you mentioned Sims is like, you know, everybody knows him. Are there any other people that you think of who come to mind in gynecology who may be famous, may have name, things named after them, who are like in history, really should not have things named after them? Pretty much all of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. No, um, I'll, that's a great question. And I, I did learn recently that there is a, a black female gynecologist in the South who... Um, is advocating to rename the Sim Speculum the um, Betsy. I, I, it's either Lucy or Betsy Speculum for that for that reason. Um, so not and and I think that's even more important that it's it's not only taking away the name but it's reclaiming the name for the person whose body was used to perfect the procedure. Um, there's also the Sims position, right, which is um, on the side, sort of entering from behind. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what that yeah. could be called. Um, I've also read about this guy, Robert Batty, um, and Batty's operation yeah. was um, a, a removal of ovaries uh, to induce menopause. Um, he's another character. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm also of the notion that, yes, we should take away names that are honoring them, but we need to not forget their stories, yeah. right? So... Yeah, take them away from med, or, or require that if you're going to learn them in med school, you're also going to learn them in the context of what they did. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are at time. So oh, well, the person that had the microphone that didn't get, did you? Oh, were, one is that okay? Question. I feel bad because you were holding it. Okay. No, yeah. Well, the guy and, you know. <laughs> Okay, my quick question, I, I don't know if it's quick, but um, one of the things I've noticed, it, like the term normal, nor, normalcy, um, like uh, coming from a trans perspective, that's kind of funny. Like, <laughs> what do you mean by normal exactly? Yeah. Um, and there's so much uh, variety, you know, to vaginas and the like. And so I guess, what did they define as normal? especially in appearance wise and um, coming like with the feminist movement as well, did they like discuss how that could be used to control women's bodies too? Like just the appearance of a vagina and like if there's like a perfect one, so to speak. Yeah. So when you say they, do you mean in all the time periods or are you thinking a particular time period? Uh, yeah. Just in general, like a quick timeline if they're, if there was any, you know, because too, it seems like the they still try to avoid looking at it like the Victorian picture. Yeah. Well, okay. So very briefly, <laughs> um, in the early period, there's a great book, Medical Bondage by Deirdre Cooper Owens, and um, and she talks about the extent to which she talks about the medical superbody of of these enslaved women. That on the one hand, they were abnormal, and that they were 
different, right? They didn't feel pain to the same extent. They were non-white. And yet, on the other hand, they were meant to symbolize a tool that would be used on normal women, if that makes sense. Yeah. So kind of um, going both ways, trying to create an exception to something, but also to rationalize all f this universal sense of wom womanhood, right? Um, so that you could justify, you know, picking on one particular group that didn't have uh, the ability to consent, really, but then applying it to a broader group. Um, and then secondly, sorry if that's not entirely clear, but um, I would say I just interviewed this feminist health activist in the UK a couple of days ago who talked about um, the extent to which group settings. So she used to go around England doing cervical self-exams. And oftentimes in her groups, everyone would get on the floor and expose themselves together. And she said one of the most revolutionary part of it for her was to see that there was no normal. That there was, that everybody looked different and it was totally fine, right? Mm -hmm. There was no normal. Um, you learned how to do things like see if there was something wrong with your cervix that indicated you could be sick, but in terms of labia and hair and body type, um, that that was for her incredibly um, <laughs> empowering because she stopped worrying about whether she was right or normal because there was no normal. Um, and so I think in the best of um, ways, 1970s feminists started that, but you know they were not perfect by any means as well. I mean, um, in terms of sexuality and race, they were still you know limited in their ability to to see through things. I mean, so much has changed in terms of our understanding of trans and bodies and stuff since then. It's it is sort of like a new chapter, but it's useful for us to then try to plug it back in and see what what could have been differently if we had that lens then that we have now, how could we see things differently? So thank you, that was, I'm glad you had the opportunity to yeah, thank ask you. that. <laughs> thank you. Do you want to come? Oh. Well, I just, I just wanna thank you all for coming and being such a terrific audience with great questions. So just join me in thanking Dr. Wendy Klein. <laughs>